Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's Geotox Express webinar. Um, we're very excited, uh, myself Mackenzie Mills and I'm here joined with uh, my coworker and friend Jeff Hatzel. Um, we are going to be going over what is new in Global Mapper Standard 25.1. Um, so how are you doing today, Jeff? Doing good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me back, Mackenzie. I always like to do things with you. Yeah, it's always fun to do a webinar together. Um, and we're very excited to share these new features in Global Mapper Standard. Um, this version was released just last week, so it is brand new. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, we're gonna go over some of those new features and you can always download um, the program, check out these new features for yourself. So before we dive into our main content here, we've got a couple things to go over, um, some general stuff we go over every webinar, which is the webinar format. Um, attendees are in listen only mode. So our audience, hopefully you guys can hear us, but if you talk, we cannot hear you. Um, if you do have questions, comments, you know, something you wanna tell us during this, this live webinar, um, please use that questions panel that you should see as part of the GoToWebinar interface. Um, Jeff and I will be keeping an eye on that and trying to answer questions as we go along in this webinar. Um, and we can you know, get you email answers afterwards for maybe some of the more in-depth questions. This session is also being recorded. Um, so after this webinar live broadcast, uh, we're gonna save that into a video and anyone who has been registered to attend this webinar uh, we'll get an email with access to that recording to review again, share with a colleague, or finish watching if you have to step out at some point. So this is um, one of the webinars that we are doing this, this month. Um, next week, we are continuing with this theme of what is new in Global Mapper, but we're addressing the new features in Global Mapper Pro 25.1. Um, so Jeff and I will be back next Wednesday to discuss some more new features in Global Mapper, um, that time the pro side of the program. Um, and we're very excited for that session as well. So be sure to register for that webinar if you haven't already, so you can get all of the new features uh, available in Global Mapper. After that, next month in March, we are going to be going over some top 10 Global Mapper tips and tricks in Global Mapper Pro. So whether you are a new user, an experienced user, you know, I encourage you to sign up for that one, tune in, or maybe view the recording after the fact so that um, maybe you'll learn something about uh, a new functionality in Global Mapper or a new tip or trick you didn't know before. And then in April, we're gonna be addressing the Blue Marble Academic Program. We do have an academic program with some labs and educational materials um, for you know, students um, at accredited universities. And uh, we will be addressing that program, talking all about it and showing some examples uh, in April. So for more information on any of these sessions, read a little bit about them and register um, for reminder emails and to attend these webinars, you can uh, go to our website. Um, the URL is on screen there uh, for more information. Ah, so we have a variety of upcoming training. Uh, it seems like we always have training on the books. Um, I was just looking at our attendee list right now and seeing names of, of people who I met through training. And so I've always enjoyed being a part of our training, um, you know, more so when my schedule allowed, but we still have a ton of training going on. Um, for those of you who work with any, you know, more advanced geodetics, coordinate system transformations and things of that nature, we have uh, our applied geodesy training and geographic calculator training coming up at the end of this month. Uh, so that's a great one where you're going to learn more than you thought you could know about geodetics and geodesy. Uh, then the middle to end of March, we have our global mapper classes, uh, general geospatial analysis, terrain analysis, and LIDAR processing in global mapper. For those of you who've been around the block a bit with our training, uh, these are different names essentially to um, the same products and the same content. So we have intro, basic intro level course, geospatial analysis. Um, terrain analysis now has its own dedicated sessions. And then of course, LIDAR processing has always kind of stood alone by itself as well. Um, the only, the real reason we made this change was that we started to have requests for people who just needed to do a little bit more um, 
specific training. You know, you may be pretty good with Global Mapper, but just need to look at terrain analysis or conversely, you don't care at all about terrain analysis, but want to learn how to use the application in depth. And so you might just attend general geospatial analysis class. Uh, so take a look out for those. You can find more details on, on what each section covers on our website. And if you haven't heard by now, we also have a um, <clears throat> introductory self-training available uh, at training.bluemarblegeo.com. And so that's a great way to take a look at, um, there's some free courses up there with sample data to work through, talk you through the applications. Um, in a week or two, Mackenzie and I will be getting workflows up there uh, based on what we look at today in this webinar. So you'll be able to look and, and see some of that data and those workflows too, if you wanna refresh your memory and have some guidance through the What's New tools. And that will also be a place to uh, scope out some upcoming um, custom paid courses if you want to get into some more advanced functionality um, and, and a little more detail into specific tools, keep an eye out there as well for that. But I think that wraps up everything upcoming for training. Yeah, so we have a lot coming up for training, um, a lot going on there. And now we're ready to get into, you know, the meat of this webinar, the uh, agenda, all these new features and updates in Global Mapper 25.1. Um, so we're going to start with some updates to the Path Profile tool. This is an existing tool, but there have been some changes visually and some functionality changes. Um, we're going to look at some visualization options with the Hillshade tool, um, that dynamic hill shading, and a slight change to that dialogue with a new option there. Uh, we'll take a look at a, an improvement to the 3D viewer and the way that data can be interacted there with the feature information tool. Uh, we'll then look at mesh feature cropping, so cropping those 3D model mesh features, um, you know, expanding the ways you can work with those features in Global Mapper. And finally, a new export option has been added. Um, this is a variation on the STL format, um, specifically optimized for 3D printing. Um, so we'll show that dialog, show that export, and you know what Global Mapper can do there. So with that, I will jump right into our first bullet point here on the path profile updates. Um, for this, I'm going to bring up an instance of Global Mapper. I've got some terrain data loaded here. Um, this is an area um, around Denali. Um, and we're going to look at the Path Profile tool. So I will go ahead and grab that tool from the Analysis Toolbar up top and just draw a profile across some of the terrain that I have here. We can see that dialog pop up. And, you know, this to this point, we're just looking at functionality in this tool that has been already existing. It's a very great tool for viewing that cross-section um, of 3D data. Um, in Global Mapper Standard, this is going to work with any gridded data, so terrain grids like this. Um, if you're working in Global Mapper Pro, you'll also be able to view LiDAR data um, and point clouds with this tool, um, get a side profile look at the data. So one of the, you know, usability improvements that we've incorporated for this tool in Global Mapper 25.1 is some improvements to the settings dialog. So those settings can be accessed by right-clicking in the main view with the path profile tool enabled. There's also a button for those right in the path profile view toolbar. So I can go ahead and click that button, open the path profile settings. Now for users that may be familiar with the tool, the settings dialog should look a little bit different. All the same options are there. We've just organized them a little bit better and split them up into multiple tabs. In previous versions of Global Mapper, all of these settings were on one dialog about this size and we were just running out of room, getting very cramped because this tool has a lot of options for customizing how you're looking at the data. So we have three tabs now for our path profile settings. Uh, we're gonna start with general settings. This is you know, general settings for the tool, uh, what units we're displaying our elevation in, um, whether we wanna set an explicit elevation range to show in that profile view, um, our elevation scale and some other checkbox options down here. Um, over here, uh, this was an option available in a menu, it still is, but now available in the general settings as well. And that is how we're sampling the terrain across the drawn path. So what I have set here is the default value for sampling 1,024 times along the drawn line in order to get this cross-sectional view in Global Mapper. 
Um, you know, we can drastically reduce that number to get a simplified view of this terrain. I'll hit apply and we can see in the profile view that we've lost some of the detail there. Our terrain has been smoothed out. Um, so you can really customize how you're viewing this terrain and what data points are being used. There are also options here to um, just sample the elevations only along the vertex points of the drawn profile or the selected line and then sample elevations at a fixed distance interval. So, you know, putting in a larger distance interval like this, we're going to get a further simplified version of that profile. Um, but it's just another way to customize this view and work with this data. I'm going to return this to the default value and talk about a couple other settings in the dialog, um, a couple of the new settings here. So we've always had the ability to turn off and on the general elevation guidelines. I've just turned off those dotted guidelines um, going across my terrain. Uh, we still have that elevation scale going vertically here, but those lines going across have been removed. We have a new option to specify a single reference line where you want to draw that for the elevation. So checking this box, uh, the value is going to default to the middle of the you know, elevation range for the profile that we're viewing. And it's just going to place a single static line across this data. Um, we'll be able to you know, still zoom and pan in this profile view and see where our terrain intersects this reference elevation. Um, so this can be very useful if you're looking at um, you know, a specific height across some terrain, um, seeing where that may intersect with uh, different features, um, or looking at a point cloud in the profile view and wanting to see you know, maybe trees over a certain height or elevation. The next tab of the settings dialog is data display. Um, we have some options in here for how we're displaying the data, um, what data is going to be displayed. Uh, a new option here is the ability to select the layers that you would like to display in the path profile. So we've always had the option to draw separate lines for um, different layers of terrain that are in the workspace. Um, if I had multiple terrain layers in this workspace, we would see multiple there. We now have the option to select the layers that you'd like to draw. So if you have five, however many layers of terrain data overlapping a profile line, you can choose to maybe only draw one or two that are relevant um, to the, the view that you're trying to generate here. Other options in this dialog are existing from the previous, again, just reorganized and grouped a little more logically. One of our big improvements to this tool is a new method for path profile um, visualization and path profile creation. So I've drawn just a single line that we've been looking at in this profile view, um, a method for perpendicular profiling. So you know, intersecting our drawn profile line perpendicularly um, a certain number of times. That has always been an option, or for a while has been an option in the Path Profile tool. And we can take a look at that. I'm viewing a very small perpendicular line to my drawn profile, and I can scroll through those views. The new option here is the ability to display parallel profile lines. So here I have my drawn line. I can choose to create parallel lines on the left, right, or both sides of my line, and that's in relative to the direction in which that line is drawn. Um, I can choose the number of parallel profiles that I would like to show, and then the distance between those parallel profiles. So I will increase that distance so we can see it a little more clearly on our data here. Click apply and zoom in a little bit so we can see these profiles 100 meters apart. Again, I can use these arrow buttons or the arrow keys on my keyboard to move through those profiles. So this might be useful for a segment of a ridge line, looking at how that elevation changes, um, you know, 
sampling part of a road center line and then moving over to the edge of the road or a proposed expansion to the road or drainage ditch on the side of that. Um, there's a lot of applications for just another method to offset a drawn profile to one side or the other. One final update I want to talk about in the path profile tool um, is going to be a visualization option that we find with this drop down in the profile tool window. Now, right now, my terrain that I have displayed is shaded with this green color, and that can be customized with a right click in the profile window and choosing to set the terrain color. Um, but the new option with this drop down in the profile is to shade the terrain based on an elevation shader. So we have these shaders in Global Mapper to display elevation um, or shade the elevation values of gridded data in 2D and 3D view. And we've now expanded that to the path profile. So we can see that shader with the same shader as in the 2D view. Um, if you have a layer specific shader assigned, that can be viewed here. We can choose any other elevation shader that we have in Global Mapper, including generated or created custom shaders. So here I have a custom elevation shader, just a scale between two colors, and I've applied that um, to my path profile view. This can match or can be different from the shader used for the layer in the 2D and the 3D view. So just giving a little more context to that elevation. Um, showing that change in elevation uh, visually and making a, a pretty graphic um, if you're looking to export this to an image or use it in a map layout. So those are the main updates that we've got for the path profile tool. Um, again, a very useful tool for working with terrain data in Global Mapper Standard and Point Cloud and LiDAR data as well in Global Mapper Pro. Um, a few different updates there um, to view that data differently and interact with the tool um, a little more efficiently. So with that, I think Jeff's going to move on to some addition, additional visualization options that we have in Global Mapper 25.1. Um, I can pass him the screen. Sure. And, and while you're doing that, Mackenzie, um, I thought I would comment that for, for many of you on the call, I see names that um, were actually part of the, the profile updates request. So the vast majority of that, if Mackenzie didn't say this already, is from user requests. And then, of course, Mackenzie, while you were talking, we had two people write in um, asking for even more functionality in that tool, both of them asking for a similar thing. So um, it's always great to you know, get that feedback from, from everybody. Yeah, absolutely. We do a lot of user-driven development, so we, we love to hear suggestions, mm -hmm. and a lot of those do make it into the program. But so uh, what we're going to take a look at here is a couple different ways that we can interact with and view our data. And so to start, we're just looking at a terrain layer here. And what we're going to look at is some updates to um, the hill shading or the dynamic hill shading. And hill shading is what gives us shadowing and relief on any of our 3D terrain data, right? Otherwise, without hill shading on, the data just looks flat. It's colored by elevation, but we don't really get a sense of depth gain. A couple of years ago, we added in dynamic hill shading. Uh, and that allows you to you know, specify a whole bunch of parameters and settings with how your, your shader and your lighting looks. Well, what's new for 25.1 is in the bottom left-hand section of this tool here, uh, allows you to customize uh, the sun angle based on date, time, and location. So you'll see when I pop open the tool, it grabs my current date and time, and I could use the center of my map to calculate the sun angle. Now we'll see this looks, looks much different because now we have the sun angle at the appropriate location for where we would be on the map. You know, default generally, um, when we talk, think about shading and hill shading, uh, the sun is placed, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, artificially to the north, um, given how we interpret light on the screen and, and things like that that I uh, don't know all the details of. 
But uh, many times it's important for us to be able to reflect what the landscape would look like where I am. And so you can either choose to set the sun um, angle based on your current date time. I could, you know, customize these if I wanted, different dates, different times, etc. And I could also specify a location. So maybe not incredibly uh, applicable here. Uh, you know, I'm only looking at uh, right a couple kilometers worth of data. So adjusting the center might not do anything for me, but I could on the map go ahead and, and place somewhere where I want my sun angle to be centered. I won't do that now, but you know, if you're working over a larger area, uh, or maybe you need to focus on a specific location within your data set, uh, a great way um, to do that. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my current location in case I change that. I did not. Um, the nice thing about this is it will also be retained in 3D view here. Let me dock in 3D view. And so the, the sunlight perspective is the same in 3D as it is in 2D. So it really allows us to get um, a, a really good perspective of um, <clears throat> our data with that new uh, hill shading and, and sun angle location. So I'm going to go ahead and enable uh, a little bit more data here. So we're looking at, this is similar data set to what Mackenzie was looking at, happens to be near Denali in Alaska. Um, some base map imagery, shockingly, we don't have great uh, <laughs> imagery available for uh, well in Alaska, but that's okay for these purposes. And I went ahead and made some contours and I calculated uh, the peak value of the mountain as well. And, and very often when we're working with, you know, multiple data sets. We have different types of data loaded. Um, you know, 2D view allows us to see a lot, right? I have all my contour labels and everything. Um, but sometimes the feature info tool allows us a quick way to get even more information about a given feature, right? You can go ahead and select all of that information and see it quickly. Well, now we can do this in 3D view as well. You know, we think about how often we're working with terrain data, uh, point cloud data, mesh data, things like that. And so as we're bringing all these other data sets in with our 3D scenes, we're probably going to be able to want and look at some information about them as well. So I'm going to zoom in here a bit to Denali. Um, still have all my contours. My imagery is draped on my terrain. Um, nothing out of the ordinary there. I can now go ahead and click a feature. I can see its feature information directly in 3D view. All of that same information is available to me there. Um, also helpful if maybe you need to really get in and take a look at a specific point that I turn that point off, I might have. But we use the smaller contour here. So I can zoom in, see whatever feature information I need. And if maybe you're working on dual displays, um, or you know side by side like i am now you'll also get a reflection of that in the 2d view so you have all the information on hand as you need it um, and as you need to work with it so really you know handy way um, to to adapt kind of the application to your workflow as you need to work with and interact with data All right, Mackenzie, I will go ahead and kick it back to you. If we haven't had any questions come in. Uh, no, no questions on those features so far. Um, both very useful for interacting with more of that 3D data and visualizing it though. Um, thanks, for, thanks for showing those, Jeff. Yeah. If I can grab the screen back. I will share again, and we're still gonna be looking at Global Mapper. Um, I'm in the same workspace here with the same um, data area, but I'm looking at a different layer now. I've gone ahead and generated a mesh feature um, from the terrain grid that we were looking at with the PAP profile tool and some imagery of the area. So again, this is the area around Denali. Um, I had a terrain grid here and some imagery I'd see those coming in and intersecting with my 3D layers in the 3D viewer. Um, and I've gone ahead and created a mesh right in Global Mapper from that terrain. Um, and it has been textured with the image layer. So this can be done, just for those who may not be aware, from the layer menu. 
Uh, there is an option to create mesh features from raster and terrain here. You're getting the structure of that mesh from the terrain grid and then the texture um, applied visually from any imagery. Um, if you don't have imagery available, it's going to use whatever shader you have active to color or texture um, the generated mesh feature. This dialog allows you to you know, change the vertical units, um, resample the data if you need to, resample the texture um, size here, and then at the bottom, simplify the mesh. So you can generate the mesh at a higher resolution with a smaller grid spacing, and then simplify it down to a percentage of the total size. Um, and so that's gonna help create a smaller and more manageable file, especially if you're working with a large area. Um, so this, you know, not new in 25.1, but a useful tool for you know, getting to uh, these mesh or 3D model features in Global Map. So I have one of these already created here. I'll go ahead and turn off the imagery and terrain that I've popped on. And you know, we can see that in the 3D view. If I zoom in pretty far on my 2D view here, uh, we start to see the structure of it. So we're seeing those faces pop into view um, and we're seeing the structure, we're seeing that they're irregular in some places uh, due to the simplification that I had applied when generating this mesh. Similarly, in the 3D view, we see this mesh. It looks very similar to imagery draped on terrain uh, in the 3D view, but I can turn on a wireframe view and we can see that same network. The structure of this mesh and those lines vertices are colored uh, with the texture colors as well. So we still get that additional context even in this um, view of the data. So the new improvement for working with mesh data uh, in Global Mapper is going to be the ability to crop this data. So I'll go ahead and zoom out on my 2D view, a little bit on my 3D view, and enable an area feature here that I have called Crop Area. I will select that area feature it's a rectangle just you know bounding the area closer to uh, the the mountain here and i want to crop this mesh to make it a smaller size focus on the area that i need to work with or create a model or fly through with um, in global mapper so to crop this feature i'm going to come up to the existing crop to selected areas tool now this Interface in total isn't new in Global Mapper 25.1. The new option here is this checkbox for meshes. So of course we can crop areas, lines, and points with this tool, but now we can also crop mesh, mesh features, which can be very useful, especially if you, you know, get a, lar a mesh for a larger area and you really only need a smaller sample of that area. Um, you can definitely reduce that file size and make it more manageable with a crop. Options in this dialog, we can either mark the cropped features outside of this area deleted uh, in the same layer, or I can create a new layer um, with just my cropped mesh area. So I'll do that, click OK. Global Mapper is going to execute that crop. We've got the new layer in the control center here. I can turn off my original mesh feature and we immediately see that crop happen, revealing just my cropped mesh layer in the 2D and 3D view. Again, we've retained the same structure from our original mesh here. We can see that with the wireframe view. We've just reduced the, the footprint of it, um, you know, cropped it to a smaller, more focused area that we are interested in. Now, Global Mapper has multiple ways to export uh, mesh features. We can export them to a 3D format. Um, multiple 3D formats are supported for mesh features. Um, and I want to talk about one of these 3D mesh, 3D model exports. Um, but it is you know, optimized for some grid-based data as well. So I'm actually going to go back and work with that grid-based data. Um, for this, I will quickly bring up my elevation grid once more, our source data. Um, I can perform the same crop if I want 
on this data uh, with the same polygon bounds, just a slightly different method through the layer options for raster-based data, of gridded data, and imagery. And from this option, Global Mapper can automatically create that mesh structure on export to a 3D format as well. Um, for this, I am going to choose our new export option for 3D printing. So exporting to STL format is something that Global Mapper has been able to do for a few versions um, to support you know, mesh features. But optimizing that export for 3D printing, being able to vertically scale the data, set a specific size, um, add a base are all new options in this specialized export um, so that you're ready to load this into a program and you know, directly print an area that you've explored and analyzed in Global Mapper. So I'll choose this option for STL 3D printing and click OK. I'll save this file and we will get our export options. Here I can set the dimensions of my export um, in millimeters or another unit with this drop down. I'll set this to a smallish size um, for this print. I can then scale the elevation. Because when you're 3D printing, especially if you're working with an area that doesn't have huge drastic elevation changes, um, you might want to increase that elevation exaggeration, similar to how you can do that in the 3D viewer, just for visualization purposes, so you get more of that um, variation in elevation, that texture coming through when you have your finalized print. So I'll enter a scale value of 2.5 here. Um, I'm then able to add a base to this model. So it's not just going to be this one sheet um, like we're seeing in the 3D view that has those um, that texture um, and shape on the bottom as well as the top. We're going to add a base to create a flat bottom with some sidewalls um, in the base thickness measurement here in order to create a nice model that can be easily 3D printed and extra support structures don't need to be added. So I'm going to add a base thickness of, we'll go with 10 millimeters here. Um, and we can, you know, sample our data at a different resolution if we'd like. I can change this resolution um, up just a little bit and I will click OK. Global Mapper is going to quickly create that mesh as part of this export and export it to the selected file. Um, once we have done that, um, we can open this mesh and, and take a look. Oh, I guess I didn't down sample my mesh quite enough. I'll just redo that process quickly um, so that we get a, an export pretty quickly here. So again, saving my layer and just entering these same parameters for 3D printing here. Um, I'll dramatically decrease my resolution. All right, well, I, I guess I'm not, um, I didn't practice this routine enough. Um, my computer is not being able to handle some of those big mesh faces. faces. I'm, I'm working on a laptop here, so it's not the best uh, processing that I have available. Let's see if I can bring up a previous version, a previously created version of some 3D print um, so that we can see what that export is going to look like you know, with the base and everything. Um, this is a print that a um, a friend of ours, Jeff here at Blue Marble, Sam Knight, Director of Product Management, did for uh, Katahdin, a mountain in Maine here. And opening this just in the 3D print Windows viewer here, we can see, you know, that terrain texture up top. And very important for 3D printing is this base and side walls that we're seeing here. So we're able to um, see that information. And uh, this will be easy to load into whatever program you use to directly execute that 3D print um, pretty easily in Global Mapper. 
So a couple new ways to create mesh features and uh, work with those mesh features with some cropping uh, in Global Mapper here. Um, just jumping back to the mesh cropping a little bit, I do want to show another workspace um, that involves a tool from Global Mapper Pro here that folks may be familiar with, uh, Pixels to Points. Um, another great use case for cropping a mesh feature is cropping a mesh that was generated from drone collected images through the pixels to points tool in Global Mapper. Here I have one of those mesh features. Uh, we can see that we've got some holes where we've got vegetation that wasn't completely filled in, not well captured in these images. We've got an irregular edge on this mesh feature. And if I'm just interested in this center area around the building, I can create a quick polygon in Global Mapper around that area that I wanna focus on. And again, do a quick crop on this data, Global Mapper is going to crop that mesh. And I've just reduced the size, created a nice clean model for a specific area. Um, you know, all of this, again, generated with the pixels to points tool in Global Mapper Pro from drone collected images. So expanding some of the cleanup of data uh, from that tool as well. And I think that wraps up what we have for new features uh, in Global Mapper 25.1. Just coming back to our agenda, we went over the path profile updates, uh, the hillshade updates. Jeff talked about um, setting that lighting feature um, by date, time, and location. Uh, expanding the feature information tool for vector features in the 3D viewer, doing some mesh feature cropping on mesh features created in Global Mapper or loaded in, into Global Mapper from a previously created file. And then finally, that export to STL format for 3D printing, adding that base um, and scaling to a feature in order to you know, easily 3D print that and get some really cool physical models of your data possibly. One other thing that uh, we'd like to talk about is how to upgrade to Global Mapper 25.1. Jeff, I'm not sure if you want to want to take this one and talk a little bit about that upgrade process if folks have questions on how to get to this new version and start using these tools. Uh, yeah, sure. So we actually had somebody ask while, while you were demoing there. Um, if you have active maintenance and support, um, you can go ahead and, and download 25.1. Uh, from our downloads page. Uh, it should download and install and update whatever current version you have installed as well. Um, support is active usually for a year from purchase. So anybody who recently upgraded to 25.0 back in the fall, 25.1 should work fine. Um, if you have any issues with that, um, feel free to shoot an email to our sales team. Um, that address is authorize or orders at bluemarblegeo.com. It's actually on the bottom of the screen here. Uh, somebody asked if you need to uninstall the previous version first. Uh, you do not. Um, 25.1 will effectively update 25.0, uh, and this way you'll retain any settings or any, any custom work that you have done as well. So you should not need to, to do any full uninstall or anything like that. Uh, you should be able to install and, and then go ahead and work with the application. Thanks for talking about that upgrade process because uh, we do get quite a few questions about how users, you know, they want to use the latest version, but they need to know how to get that licensed. Um, another point to, you know, having to uninstall one version before the next, um, as Jeff was saying that, you know, you can install Global Mapper 25.1 without having to uninstall 25.0. Um, so if you, you know, have a current license uh, and are able to upgrade to 25.1, it's a pretty simple process there. Um, but if you don't have a current license and you want to take a look at version 25.1, explore some of these new features, see how they can be useful in your workflows, you can go ahead and download a trial um, of the new version and work with that uh, while maintaining your older version of Global Mapper on your machine. Um, in that fully unlocked state until you're ready to complete that upgrade to the latest version. Um, so another way that you guys can explore and work with these, these features and updates uh, if you want to explore them um, before you commit to that um, license upgrade.
And that wraps up what we have planned for this uh, Geotox Express session here. Um, we got some good questions during the session about these new features and some good suggestions for uh, possible future new features in some of the tools of Global Mapper. Um, next week, as I said at the beginning, we're going to be exploring the new features in Global Mapper Pro version 25.1. So visit our website, register for that webinar to see some of those features, um, some of those more advanced functionality, working with point clouds and some other data. And uh, if you folks have any questions about these new features, Global Mapper in general, really any question about the program, uh, feel free, please do reach out to our technical support team. The email's on screen, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com, um, and we're happy to answer whatever questions you have. Um, any, any final thoughts on that, Jeff? Uh, only thing I'll add is somebody just asked about a few new pro features, and I'll have to say stay tuned for next week before we have anything posted for that, and we'll discuss it, and then those workflows will be posted as well. Yep, so tune in next week to see those features, um, some exciting stuff in Pro as well. Um, and with that, uh, we've come to the end of our, our Geotalks for today. Um, thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.